Well, hello everybody. This is Ralph Fletcher, and this is Writing with Ralph, Session 10. And um, this may be the last one we're going to be doing. It's the last weekly one I will do. I've been doing them every Wednesday. And um, I may do a couple of others um, here and there over the next few months. I reserve the right to do that. But um, in terms of um, our regular time together, um, this is the, the 10th. 10 feels like a good round number. Um, so um, here in New Hampshire, it's uh, the end of um, April and things are slowly getting warm. Um, we've been doing some sort of stay at home <clears throat> um, like everybody else for, oh God, it seems like about five weeks now, maybe more, maybe six weeks. And um, even though um, I don't have much hair, I'm starting to get a little shaggy on the side here. Um, I need a haircut like everybody else. Um, but it's been also a chance to slow down, do some reading, take some long walks, take a lot of pictures, which is something that I love to do. Um, so I'm going to start by reading a couple poems that I've been doing, reading them from other students. This one is by Paulina, and she wrote about uh, hockey, playing hockey, and she um, comes from us to us all the way from... Um, Amsterdam. She calls it my straight A. Um, swoosh, bang, knock, goal. Let the hockey game roll. Speed, wind, fresh air. Make the hockey game fair. Cool, coach, best team. Do your best to reach your dream. Grass, ball, stick, me. We're the hockey team V. I like the energy in that poem. Um, the way she just has those little short punchy um, descriptors that really bring the poem and give it some momentum and some energy. Nice job, Paulina. Um, there's another poem that I have that was written by a New York City gal named Alicia Vaughn, and it's called Taking a Stand. Taking a Stand. I think she was in fifth grade when she wrote this. <clears throat> How do we hold this world in our hands? Help each and every troubled man. How can we live? Today I stand impatiently waiting. All we need is an independent woman like me. I shall be more than a girl. Take me as I am. I can stand the pressure. Stand me alone. That is a strong poem. And I love the way she capitalizes certain uh, letters at the end. Um, I should be more than a girl. Take me as I am. I can stand the pressure. Stand me alone. We talked earlier about how poetry needs to have a strong ending, and she certainly ended strong there. Um, I really like that. That reminds me of the power of writing. Okay. Um, and I thought I would read something um, of my own. Um, so... This is a poem about, you've ever been to a family reunion and, uh, you know, you get there and there's all kinds of people that you don't see that often, grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins that sometimes you don't even know the names of. That's the way it was with me. I grew up in a family. My, my mom and dad were each one of eight children. So I had like 60 some cousins. I had just lots of cousins. Um, so in my book, um, Relatively Speaking, um, I wrote a poem um, called Shrink Wrapped, and a, which is about like what the, how that feels. So I thought I'd share that with you guys right now. Um, it's on page 29. Okay, um, Shrink Wrapped. And really it's about like going from the reunion and then going back home again, how your family feels different after you've been with all those other relatives. Shrink Wrapped. We leave the reunion, go home to a house that's much too quiet. No more tag or kick the can or killer croquet with my cousins. No more bloody war stories from my big bellied uncles. No more staying up late watching TV while the grown ups crazy laugh around the kitchen table. Just us, boring us. Our family becomes like a package of plums, shrink wrapped at the supermarket, so small and tight I can hardly breathe. Okay, 
So, um, this is a session that we do about, we do writing. We actually don't do writing, we write. And so, um, <clears throat> I'm hoping that you guys have some writing utensils with you right now. And I'd like to give you like um, just a minute to actually write, write about how, what you're feeling right now. Um, let's get, we'll say 90 seconds. And um, just talk about um, how you're feeling right at this minute. All right, so I actually will um, will join you too, and um, let's do some writing. Okay. All right. When we finish here, you certainly, I would encourage you to, to read this to um, a friend or somebody in your family, somebody that's with you today. Um, I wrote today about just um, kind of the way I've been feeling. These days, I remember the ordinary pleasures that I took for granted. A restaurant meal, cinema popcorn, hugging my grandsons. Why is it that why is it that cinnamon cinema popcorn tastes so much better than the stuff that you make at home? I don't know. Somebody said it has to do with the oil or the butter they put into it. Um, you know, I've been um, talking about my own books, about you know the writer's notebook, and I've been talking about um, my memoir, Marshfield Dreams, and also some of the poetry books I've written. But I've written a lot of other books. I just wanted to quickly mention some of those books to you. Um, so. I've got them right here. Um, let's see here. Flying Solo. Um, it's kind of an autobiographical story about that starts on one Christmas, it goes to another Christmas, and it's very much related on my life. Um, it's a funny book at the beginning, but then there's a moment of real sadness to it, so it's kind of an emotional roller coaster. Um, I think you guys would like that. Um, Spider Boy, a book about a kid who loves spiders. He's obsessed with spiders. He keeps a journal about spiders, and he actually has a tarantula. But he moves to a new town. He moves from Illinois to New York, and he gets picked on, and he's got to find a way to stand up for himself. This kid's in seventh grade, um, and every chapter begins with some details from his spider journal, and sometimes the details from the journal kind of reflect what's going on in his life. Um... Flying Solo, it's about a class of kids whose teacher goes to a conference one day, but there's a mix-up in the office, so they don't get a sub, the sub doesn't show up, and basically the kids decide to run the class themselves for, for one day. These are sixth graders, and there's no teacher, no sub, no sub for the sub, and um, it's kind of a book that's got two levels. It's fun to see if the kids can get away with it, but on the other hand, um, there's certain issues that are serious that they can't really deal with until there's no teacher in the room. So I think you'd like that one. One of my most popular books. Um, Harry Potter. Um, okay, all right. It's possible that I didn't write this one. All right. I'll admit it. I did not write Harry Potter. Why didn't I think of that? Come on, Ralph. Um <laughs> Uh, this is called Also Ro Known as Rowan Pohai, and this is a young adult book for kids at middle school and high school. It's about these kids who invent another student, and they get him applied to a really posh, expensive school, and he gets into it. Um, I think you guys will like that one. And then uh, my latest book for teachers is a book called Focus Lessons, 
and it talks about how you can use photography to teach writing. I won't say any more about that right now, but if you're intrigued, I think you might like that one. Okay, so um, we've been talking about uh, memoir and poetry, and, and today we're going to be talking about um, something that's kind of goes across all kinds of writing, and that's revision, revising your writing. Um, and I know that sometimes when you talk about revision uh, in a classroom of students, kids kind of groan because teachers expect it. A lot of kids don't really want to do it. A lot of students' attitude, a lot of, a lot of kids' attitude is like, look, I'm, I'm done. I'm finished with it. Um, I have nothing more to say about it. So let me just make a few suggestions or ask you to think about some stuff. And maybe I can give you a new way to look at revision. Um, all right, so here we go. First of all, um, so... And these are things that you, if you're taking notes, you might want to jot these down, but you don't have to. First thing is that I think revision depends a lot on rereading. A lot of kids, what they do is they write it and they say, would you read this? They, they give it to an adult or whatever. No, I think that you have to do both things. You want to write it and you want to read it and reread it. I always say that you should be the best expert in the world on your piece of writing. You should know where it's good. You should know where it's not so good, where it's kind of like uh, confusing or where, where you wander off the topic or maybe where you need to add more details or maybe when your ending isn't really as strong as you want. So you write it, but then you take that moment of rereading it. And one of my mentors, Lucy Calkins, talks about writing as a process of being passion hot and critic cold. So you write, but you also take that step back and look at it. So that's important. Um, now, second thing is that a lot of kids look at revision as a way to fix a broken piece. No, that's not the way I look at it. I think of revision as a way to honor a good piece. If I write something that's not that good, I leave it, you know. Um, but if it's interesting, you know, I might work on it. Um, the poet William Stafford has this quote that I like. He says, if I write something that interests me, um, I go back to it. If it doesn't interest me, I go on. And I think that it's okay to go on. It's, you know, sometimes you write something, it's just not that good. It's kind of, you know, boring, whatever. You're not, you, or maybe it's okay, but you're just not interested in it anymore. So give yourself permission to, to go back and revise it uh, if you want to. But look at, try to look at revision as a way to honor a good piece of writing. That means that not every piece gets revised. Um, that's number three. You don't have to revise everything. Um, you know, you can let it go. And so maybe you write three things, maybe four things, and maybe there's one of them that you go back and you really sink your teeth into and you revise it and you and you work on it. Um, the other thing is that when I do my writing, um, I play what I call the what if game. You know, uh, like in the, so that that has to do with when I'm rereading it. Like I, I write it and then I like look at it and I, I say to myself, well, what if I cut this part out? I say, um, what if I started closer to the action? I might say, um, what if I change the ending? Or what if I kind of reorder the parts? Um, and Or like if I'm writing a poem, what if I have a really good line and I move that to the front or move that to the end? You know, like, so I play the what if came a lot. Um, let me show you what I was doing here in my notebook. Um, when I was working on um, Marshfield Dreams, my memoir, um, and I'm going to use my glasses for this, um, I was writing about moving away and... Um, so down, down, down uh, here, and um, when my friends said um, goodbye, it was kind of sad. They gave me presents so I'd remember them. Steve gave me some of his best baseball cards. Andy gave me one of his prize marbles. Freddie gave me a sunburn. He used to take my hands and just twist like that and kind of make it hurt. Um, they even had a fake funeral for me. Mom and Dad stayed busy with a million details connected to the move. So you see over there, let me just see if I can show it there, the fake funeral part. And I put in the, um, in, the, in the margins a little exclamation point, and I underlined fake funeral, because I realized, you know, I probably got more to say about that. So um, when I wrote Marshfield Dreams, I went back to the fake funeral, and I just kind of pulled that out 
and I popped the kernel on that, and I really developed that. What was that fake funeral like? And um, the last chapter in my book, Funeral, in my book, Marshall Dreams, is called Funeral. That's me when I was three years old with a garden hose. Um, so I'll just read you a little bit of this. On our last morning in Marshfield, the doorbell rang at nine. When I opened it, I saw Andy, Steve, and Larry standing together. I was surprised to see them. Come on, we're taking you to the woods, Larry said. Dad came downstairs carrying two suitcases. Can I go to the woods, I asked him. He shook his head. We're leaving in less than an hour. Please, Dad, I pleaded. Just one last time. All right, but we're leaving at 10 o'clock sharp, he said. When you hear me beep the horn, you come right away, okay? Okay, I promised, and followed my friends outside. They are walking in a funny way, the way you do when you're hiding a secret. What's going on, I asked. We're having a funeral, Andy replied with a solemn face. For who? You, Steve explained. A funeral? I laughed. Hey, I'm moving. I'm not dead. Well, you'll be dead to us, Larry pointed out. We entered, we entered Ailes Woods on a path I'd run down thousands of times. I knew every rock and mushroom and pine tree by heart. In the middle of the woods, my friend stopped. There, Steve, read, Steve said, pointing to a small indentation on the forest floor. Lie down, dead man. I lay down. The ground was thick with pine needles and soft. My friends picked up big clumps of pine needles and started sprinkling them all over my body. Hey, I protested. Be quiet, Larry ordered. You're dead, remember? Keep your eyes closed. Yeah, well, just don't get out of my face, I muttered. Um, they kept sprinkling the pine needles on me until my limbs and body were covered and I could feel them like a lightweight blanket. Should old acquaintance be forgot, Steve sang. You don't sing that at a funeral, Larry interrupted. You sing that on... New Year's Eve. Andy loudly cleared his throat. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, he announced. We have gathered here to lay to rest the soul of our dear departed friend, Ralph Fletcher. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, I think I maybe read this one on a uh, other um, writing with Ralph session. But I just want to show you that, see what happened there? Basically, I had that one line in my writer's notebook on an entry, and an entry. They even had a fake funeral for me. I read that again. I underlined it. I said, you know, I think I could do more with that. And so I popped the kernel and I developed a whole chapter. And that became a really good way to end my memoir with my friends having a funeral for me that was kind of a little bit weird, a little bit tender and sweet and kind of funny all at the same time. Okay. So um, I urge you to... Um, do that. Go back and reread your writing and ask yourself, first of all, does it interest me enough to want to work on it some more? And secondly, what could I do to make it better? Um, how could I maybe take one part and develop it? Or maybe take one part that's not interesting and just cut it out and the writing could be better. All right. So this is the last session that I'm going to be doing, the last Writing with Ralph session. So I want to leave you with a few thoughts, something to just to take with you as we kind of end our time together. Um, and some of the things I'm going to say are things that I've said before, but I'll just reiterate them. First of all, get a notebook if you don't already have one, um, you know, uh, and write something every day. Writing should be a habit, um, just like any important thing that you want to build into your life. Um, a writer is somebody who writes a lot, so you want to indulge that as much as you can. Um, secondly, and this is really important. Make writing meaningful, but do whatever you can to make writing fun, okay? It shouldn't be work. It should be fun. So whatever it is that makes it fun for you, doodle, maybe. Be silly. Uh, write a love poem to somebody you've got a crush on, and maybe just keep it secret for now, uh, or not. Uh, maybe you'll create a series about four armadillo, armadillos who decide to try to take over the world. I mean, you can let your imagination go. You can write about anything. Um, so make writing meaningful, but also do whatever you can to make writing fun. And maybe even find a special place in your house where you can go and that's your writing spot. That also helps me too sometimes. Um, the third thing is read. Okay. Read as much as you can. The more you read, the better your writing will get. Um, the young adult novelist Sherman Alexi has this quote that I love. He said, um, if you call yourself a writer, you should, be, you should be reading like a maniac. If you call yourself a writer, you should be reading like a maniac. 
And the last thing, number four, the last thing I'm going to leave you with is, and this may surprise you, but the last bit of advice I give to you is don't forget to be a kid. Um, I draw on my childhood so much as a writer. And yeah, it's good to have aspirations and goals and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But there are certain things that you can only do when you're at this point in your life. Um, and I would hope that you can make space in your life for those things that, that all kids have always done and that really nourishes us through our whole lives. All right. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for your attention and spending this time with, with the mate. Um, Thanks for sending me writing. Um, if you feel like you'd still like to send me some more, you can please do that. Remember, my email is figpudding, figpudding at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye.